Uh, I just feel a sense of heaviness, um, anxiousness. Maybe that's just me, I don't know, but I just want to pray for that and against that. And Lord, I just lift that up to you right now. I lift up every person in this room to you right now, Lord. Let the words be spoken be yours, not mine. Let our hearts and our minds and our souls be open to experience you, Lord. I don't want to go through the motions of any sort of religious obligation, Lord. Let us actually connect and commune with you. Everything else is useless and secondary, Lord God. I don't want to hear stories about you. We want to feel you. Be influenced and changed by you, Lord God. So just come right now, Lord. Quiet the thoughts of our hearts, Lord. Any anxious thoughts, any burdens, any worries or stresses, Lord God. We come against that in Jesus' name. I just pray for peace where there needs to be peace, Lord. I pray for trust where there needs to be trust. I pray for love and healing where there needs to be love and healing. Lord, and if we're stumbling or something is forcing us to stumble, Lord, let us not feel shame or guilt. Let us feel absolutely confident coming before you and in front of each other, Lord. Not to express our stuff for the sake of spreading gossip or having everyone else know our business, Lord, but to be able to come knowing that we are loved and accepted by you. Jesus, so let us be those people. Let us be a community of movement, of acceptance of grace. Lord, a community influenced by you, changed by you, and becoming the influencing change of all those around us, Lord Jesus, because you're at work. Not because we're preaching at, Lord, but we can relate to, that we can love on and be loved by. In Jesus' name. You ever get that sense that you're deflated in your journey. Something's happened. You, you, everything's going good. I mean, even maybe it's your relationship with God. Maybe it's your understanding of what faith actually is. And then all of a sudden, you just feel so deflated. You feel so discouraged by whatever it may be. It might be how you're feeling. It might be a situation that comes up against you. And you just feel so stuck. And you almost start to blame yourself. You, you ever get that almost self-loathing? Like, oh, I should know better. I should be able to fix this. The point is, though, when life gets hard, it's not our responsibility when we come to Christ and have those good moments to always be on top of the mountain. Life is not always going to be easy or good, but our job is to remember that we're not less than when we stumble and fall. If you're driving on the highway and you're on a journey to a long destination, you get a flat tire, it doesn't mean the journey's over. It means the tire has to be fixed and changed. It's just different seasons in life. That's all it is. And there's no condemnation. There's no judgment. It is just life. And everyone goes through it, whether it's a physical thing, an emotional thing, a spiritual thing, something we need healing from. But what I love about Scripture is that time and time again, it relates us to being vessels of God. You look at the Old Testament and you have this one prophet who was shown a potter late at night and he's working with this jar clay, clay jar, right? And God is basically saying that even if it's cracked or it's broken, it doesn't mean it's useless. It means that the potter simply waters it down and reforms it so it can fulfill its original purpose. And how much so does God actually take more effort and energy into us that even when we are stumbling and broken and unable to do what we're meant to do, does God get out and change the flat tire in our lives? But the thing is, a lot of times we don't hear that. We, you need to do this. If you only prayed more, had more faith, you would be on your way. And that's absolute garbage is the word I'll use. Because what God says is it's not about you fixing yourself. This is, the Bible isn't a 12 steps to having a better life. It's finding yourself in God because we are vessels of God. And when his influence changes who we are at a deep level and starts to work through the things that need to be worked through and healing comes and whatever movement comes in Jesus Christ, it doesn't just change us now, but then he starts to use us as a part of his movement that originally influenced us to be an influence of change on other people around us who need it. Time after time you're hearing these stories. I love spending time. And here's one thing I learned is that if you want to be a different type of person, Surround yourself with the people you want to be because influence rubs off, especially if it's influence of God, especially if it's influence of the movement of Jesus Christ in people. That's why Sundays are great for me coming here (laughs) because all of you guys lift me up every day throughout the week and God does something, not because I'm so great, because he's just willing, which is fantastic. We get to go out and be movements of change for other people.
Not because we have an agenda, because we're willing to let God change us and then use us to bring change into other people's lives. I mean, that to me is the whole purpose of faith. If there's no encounter with God that has tangible effects on who we are, what we think, what we do, and has no tangible effects on other people around us, then there is no point in faith. I don't care what religion you belong to. You know, even talking with Tom this morning, and he's so new to the community, but you are such a pillar, Tom, and I love that, that you're having a story with a friend of yours who is coming to you that God has brought into your life because you're like-minded who needs God, and he's allowing you to be the voice of reason into his life, and God is using you to be that voice and that reason in his timing because you're so like-minded. A ministry that I could not hold a candle to by comparison because you have been put in the situation for a purpose. If I walked in and tried to have a forced religious conversation with this person, they would reject me and be so hurt because of where they are right now. But you are someone they chose to bring in. Thank you for being available. And Dawn, week after week, I love that one of the things on karaoke every Thursday is that's one of my part-time jobs. Dawn comes every week because we have fun and we don't have an agenda. We just hang out. And yet she's been used to have several conversations of faith about Jesus Christ and her story and her journey about what God has done and the change in her life. And we've seen two of our regulars get baptized at different churches but start to have deep, meaningful walks and relationships with God. Not because we're preaching at, because I am not doing anything. I'm hitting the start, stop, next singer, I'm doing a couple songs. I'm not doing anything but because she's simply willing to be available. And God says, good. And there may be times, like I said, if we have a flat tire in life, do not count yourself stopped, stuck forever. It is temporary. Let God change the tire. You know, and the thing is about that being a vessel of God, that technically it is an impossibility because we view ourselves as these imperfect vessels containing the perfect God. But I don't mean the kind of impossibility where it's like, well, I should even try and be that type of Christian or join that type of movement because I'm inevitably going to fail. No, I'm talking about is a type of impossibility that God himself alone makes possible. He says, listen, I'm doing this perfect work and I want to make you well. And you're going to struggle forever this side of eternity of making the right choices to follow me or to follow your own heart's desires which won't lead you in my will or my direction. There might be consequences, but I want you to choose me. Because I love you, because I'm pursuing you day after day. And see, that is what is the greatest difference between Jesus Christ and any other faith belief system in the world is everyone else thinks, and some people even in the church think, if I just please God enough, maybe I'll do good enough and be good enough that he'll accept me one day and love me. And Jesus says, I loved you before you even knew my name. I've been chasing after you, trying to show you love before you even knew who I was. I don't care what you do. It's about what I've done here, which makes you accessible to me. Do you want it? Be with me. And that's, again, I mean, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse every time when I'm preaching, but that is really the greatest message I could ever preach is that type of a gospel. You know, I've been really struggling because I've been talking about, with certain people about getting membership to the church. And really, it's just a two-step process. I bring you up. I say, do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you want to be an active, engaging, and voting member of this church? And you say yes, if that's your answer. And then, boop, 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 you're in. That's it. There's no ceremony. And you know what? I was really struggling. I'm going to set a date. And God's like, No. You're going to do it when I say you're going to do it. And you might do it several times to make sure people are here to actually have the opportunity. So I don't know what this is going to look like, so bear with me. And I might even ruffle some feathers because it's really not that clean or neat. But neither am I, neither is God. So don't be too overwhelmed that you're giving you forewarning. If I say, hey, you want to be a member? Come on up, we're going to do it right now. Or maybe in a couple of weeks as I start preaching more on the gospel and water baptism, I say, hey, you want to get baptized? Well, here we go. Let's do it right now. I don't know, but this is something that God is starting to weigh on my heart. Like, don't have it so programmed to your agenda. Have it organized, but let me be in control. So I'm going to let go of the wheel, and if I sink or swim, it's going to be on him. So Peter took a few steps before he sank. So here we go. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. Jesus is in the situation, and, and we, I'm skipping over a bit 
but I'm going to summarize it in a moment. It says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, them being the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Again, a separate group than we talked about last week who really were opposed against each other except in their unification of hating Jesus Christ. The Sadducees believed there is no such thing as a bodily resurrection. The Pharisees did, and that was enough to divide them forever except when it came to Jesus Christ rocking the religious establishment of the day and saying, you're missing the point. Don't make it about your status. Make it about people connecting to God intimately in relationship. Stop being a blocking point for other people to get to him. And they said, well, this is starting to rock my status, so let's come together and try and destroy this one man, because how powerful could one man be? And the scribe, one of the religious elite, is sitting there taking note of how God is standing there as a human being in front of them, and he's not sure who this Jesus is. But he sees, he came and heard them arguing, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and recognizing that he, being Jesus, had an answer and answered them well. That he had an answer for everything they were trying to trick him in, every type of question they were trying to form to trap him and make him sound stupid and foolish and embarrass him. And he kept turning it on his head to the point where now they're starting to bicker against each other in public. The plan has backfired. And then this scribe comes up to Jesus thinking there's something about him. I won't say that he's God, but he's actually starting a pursuit of coming and and testing the waters, which is good. And I think as a church, we need to let people do that. The thing is, so many people are curious about God. And they're on some sort of journey in pursuit of him. But, but Christians stand in the way almost like the religious elite and say, well, you have to come to my church and you have to do this. Stop laying ground rules. If you actually believe that Jesus is God, let him be at work in their lives. If someone is playing by the river in the words of Derwin, they might fall in. Don't push them and tie a rock around their neck, but let them find their own way in. Sometimes need, people need to dip the toe before they just dive in. You ever been in a pool, it's cold, outdoor, maybe it's a lake, and you're kind of like, I want to go in, but in my time, and you know, there's always that one jerk relative. (laughs) Huh, hey, what's that in the water? I'm like, what? It's you! Ah!" You know, and you fall in, I'm just, and I hate that person. And I hate the water, and I get out, and I go away from the water for quite a bit before I'm comfortable enough to come back. It is even more so with faith. Let people find it. Give them space. So this man who's on this journey comes and he says, what commandment is the foremost of all? What what is the greatest commandment? Again, this is a culture that God gave ten commandments to. And throughout the years, these religious elites, thinking that they really had it all figured out, took ten commandments and made it into thousands of rules that you had to abide by, which nobody could. He says, so which is the best And he comes with an honest question. He's not trying to trick him or trap him. His motives are, I'm curious, like, what, what, I've heard what you've said and it's actually registering with me. What is the best thing I can do? What is the greatest thing I need to do in order to please God and connect with him? And Jesus answered, the foremost, the greatest is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And he's quoting Old Testament here. But this phrase, hear, O Israel, are the first two words of a section of the Torah, which is the Old Testament, and is the title, better known as the Shema, of prayer services as the centerpiece of the morning and evening Jewish prayer services. These are words that this culture is engraved in, and they use a part of their daily discipline of trying to appease God in the words they pray and what they say and what they do. He's using something familiar to the audience to get their attention. The thing is, he does that for me too, and he does that for every single person. See, if God is is all-knowing, and he actually cares about pursuing people and having a relationship with him, he will use the things you care about to connect you to him. I've had more moments in my youth when I was growing up in a Christian home, but having to develop the conviction of who am I going to be? Is Christianity for me? Or is I'm just going to drag on the coattails of my parents and call myself this and really have no desire to be in it? Obviously, you know what I chose. He put me here. He's got a sense of humor. But I really struggle with a filter sometimes, so I really, even in my prayer life, tell him what I think, which, thankfully, he's got grace because I should have been struck by several bolts of lightning, you know? Dirty Harry style, like, do you feel lucky in the middle of my prayers? But he uses these words. 
that this man is so familiar with that are actually a big part of his identity, that that's how he starts to explain and answer his questions about God. Me, it was movies, movies and music. There'd be lyrics from bands that are so unchristian, but there'd be one phrase, I'm just like, oh, wow. And I can't explain why, but they just jump out and they take life and they deep root themselves in my existence and they actually had great impact. Or movies that had nothing to do about God. But for whatever reason, I find myself in different moods and stages where I'm watching rom-coms, that's romantic comedies, and just this idea of pursuing each other in the midst of chaos and something will click and I'll be like, oh, I've got something in my eye. But it really speaks to this, this absolute love and an unquenchable desire of God to pursue people, not falling into religious obedience, but being real with God. And I love that. Sometimes, alternatively, this phrase of hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, is translated as the Lord our God, the Lord is one, he alone is God. What he's saying here, he's setting up a phrase that kickstarts his actual answers. God is God alone. This is the place you're heading in the right direction. He's foreshadowing his answer by saying, you're on the right track. Life is a journey. Like I said, we need to give people space to develop that journey and lay down that track and find their place and find their own convictions because if there's no convictions about answering why you believe what you believe, but rather, well, I was forced to go in the water by the pastor and he held me under for about 30 seconds. I thought I was gonna die and he pulled me out and now I'm giving all my money to the church and praise God, I guess I'm doing the right things. No, like if you don't have a reason for being with God, let people find that. But God will give us these these insights saying, you're on the right track. It's coming. Keep going. Even when the tires are flat, let me change them. Verse, and I have none of this plan. This is great. Verse 30, and you shall love you, Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Now, the thing is, when he kicks off this phrase, you shall love the Lord your God, I've heard this preached so many times, in my opinion, in a wrong way of, of a forced commandment. You have to love God. Do it, you idiot. And it's just like, Okay, because you're making me, I guess I'll love God. But a lot of times, the only way that is measured by people who have no relationship is by what you do. You know, like I said, I've said this many times. I find it funny, so I'm going to use it again. When we were in Bible college, one of the things we had to do is, is try out different churches, right? Now, I had an experience. Bob and I went to the same Bible college. I had an experience where I went with a small group of people, and we went to the church that actually shares a parking lot with the Bible college which has no affiliation with the Bible college. Thank God. And as soon as I went to the door, the first time I've ever been there, I went to shake the guy's hand. He's like, hey, how are you? I'm like, what's your name? My name's Aaron. What's your last name? Patton. Okay, well, next time, if you want to start coming, bring a T4 slip so we can make sure you're tithing 10%. And I said, forget this. You know, and I sat through the service and I think I walked out early. I was like, well, I'm just going to make up something for my paper I have to write because this place is garbage. And I wasn't very thrilled. But time, again, like it's easier for people if they want to be in control of your journey and they want to measure the spiritual influence of God in your life. Say, what are you doing? And they'll actually try and take charge of how much you give, of how much you're involved in ministry. Can you clock in your hours for me so I can really make sure that you're developing into the right Christian? It's like, I don't think that's what Jesus did with discipleship. But the thing is, that's not what Jesus is saying. What he's implying here is it needs to be a desire for love. Which means if you're going to love someone, you have to be connected to someone. And if there's someone who's worth connecting with, you're going to have a relationship with that person who's actually going to earn your trust through intimacy and connection, who's going to say, your desire is going to be you want to love me. And the reason you're going to want to love me is because I'm going to start to do different things in your life. And they are as follows, with the heart, 
the soul, the mind, and your strength. And what he's actually listing here, and if you look into the Greek words, the Greek word for heart means the center of all physical and spiritual life. Obviously, the heart pumps. It's the strongest muscle in the body. And when you talk to people, uh, cremation even, the thing that lasts the longest is the heart because it's so strong, because its sole purpose is to pump oxygen through blood to your whole being to keep you alive. What he's also talking about here is the words we need to use. This is what God wants for you. I want to impact your heart. I want you to love me with all that you are, to, to let down the guard, to be vulnerable, because the heart is the seat of thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, endeavors, will, and character. It's who we are. You can't force someone to say, love God with all the things you care about. It's got to be an intimate, organic thing. I want you to want that. I want that type of connection with you. And not just that, I want your soul, which is self, life, person, living being, emotion, and passion. I want your mind, a faculty of understanding, feeling, desire, intellect, and I want your strength, the ability, force, strength, might, and action you produce. See, God wants this because they're all connected. It's, it's an entire encompassing phase of a person. I don't just want you to follow me blindly. I want you to have conviction of thought. And when you read and you, and you grow in knowledge of the history of Scripture, and that's one thing that I love doing now is really diving in because I have this foundation of being brought up in the church. And I know all the Sunday school stories. I know different parts of the Scriptures. But when I start to do research into the cultural impact that Jesus had in his day, and how countercultural he was, and the movement of 12 ragtags that followed after him, how they changed the world and were so countercultural, even though the Roman Empire, who was the ruling, governing force of all, said, We need to eliminate them, and they couldn't, and how it's changed the world. That through 12 men who are obedient in becoming like Jesus by surrendering through their own desire, not being forced, their heart, their soul, their mind, their strength. We saw different movements that followed centuries after them. The first example of an orphanage, we've talked about that. A man who was in a Roman citizen who became a Christian and in the ancient culture, it was okay that if you had a child of birth defect or the wrong gender or was sickly, it was okay to kill them yourselves or leave them out to die or be eaten by wild beasts. That was just common thing. This wasn't something anyone would shame you for. This was common occurrence. And this man had such a heart character change. He said, no, that there's such a love of Christ for these kids. And even in the day, there was such a thing as a failed abortion. Failed abortion, leaving this baby alive, but you just discarded it. And he would collect them. He would love them. He would bring them up to the point where he upset the Roman culture so much he was martyred for his actions because he stood against the city. He said, I stand for Jesus Christ. But that did not stop. We have orphanages today, don't we? Hospitals and hospices, when plagues ran through ancient world and people were sick or dying, it was common occurrence to just toss that family member on the streets. They would die alone to not infect the healthy part of your family. And these Christians who had no affiliation with these people were collecting them and bringing them into their homes to care for them, to pray over them, to feed them with their own resources and physically engaging with them, risking their own health because Jesus Christ changed and showed them love and they had no other option because they wanted to to show these people love it was not because they were told you have to do this they wanted to do it their passions and desires and affections and characters and their person and their understanding and the action that followed was all changed because of a journey that led them to Jesus Christ no religious obligation or commandment can tell you and force you to do this and this man is starting to the first time understand okay God cares about me on such a deep level. His desire is for me to desire to be completely open with him. So he can come into all the brokenness, know all the secrets, which, you know, he's God, he already does. But for me to want to share that with him. That my prayer, when I say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only God alone. That I'm actually opening up a line of communication. I'm not praying to some distant deity, but he wants to hear me, but he also wants me to hear him. For the first time, this man is hearing this message of connection, of opportunity to connect with God, and it's starting to change his understanding. And the scribe says to him, you know, right on, teacher. 
You have truly stated that he is one and there is no other one else besides him, that he is God alone. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. What's interesting though is he starts off with this relationship with God. And the second commandment he says, now I also want you, after you've gone through this phase, this part of the journey where you're able to be influenced. And the influence of change creeps into your life and starts to change who you are. Not because it's a forced agenda, because God is so present and so palpable and tangible that you can't help but engage them constantly. And he's doing a work in your life. Now I want you to see other people and I want you to love them as yourself, which means two more standards of love and what that actually looks like have been impacted. That you need to love other people, not be a mat, not be walked over, but to love and care for other people and to serve them, but also to love yourself. And if I'm honest, the hardest part is that third part of the commandment, which just seems like a tagline. Love yourself because Jesus loves you. And that third part will start to be impacted by the first part of allowing God into your desires, your passions. And being real with it, sharing it with him. Ken spoke honestly this morning, but yes, sometimes we ask for things in our prayer life that really aren't great, but God still wants to hear about it. He cares about what you care about. I pray for the stupidest things because I think he cares. Lord, I'd really like a parking spot near the mall door. Is it life-threatening? No. Do I always get it? No, but sometimes I do. More often than not, it's because my pregnant wife who struggles sometimes needs it. (laughs) I still pray for it even when she's not there. I'm like, yeah, she's here. Just don't look, Lord. Can I have that spot? No. I'm on. Cold. But it's about letting God be a part of what you care about, about who you are. Letting God define and impact those areas of your life that are so precious that really make us up as individuals. It's much more than burnt offerings and sacrifices. See, what he's saying is the love and intimacy and relationship we can have with God, which changes the way we love ourselves and changes the way we love other people, is so much more than our best religious actions on their own. He's talking to a Jewish man in the system of it was always but what you could bring to the temple to offer as your best as a sacrifice to God for temporary atonement of all the wicked and wrong things you did that break relationships with yourself, with God, and with other people. You know, it's amazing to me that we sing that song today, and I'm so glad that you did bring it up this morning. It's your breath in our lungs. We pour out our praise. That goes back to Genesis as God is creating everything and he's saying it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Then it comes to people and he takes a bit more intimacy and a bit more interaction. He says, you know, it's not just enough to speak life and to have existence. I need you to be fully alive and separate from everything else I've made. And the Holy Spirit comes down and the first moment of interaction between God and human beings is the breath of life coming into our lungs, which is the Holy Spirit giving us a soul. Nefesh is that word for soul. The Spirit of God, the Ruach Elohim comes down and breathes life through the Spirit that gives us a soul and he gives us passions, desires, and appetites and the things that set us alive. Why should anything else that has to do with the faith system about Jesus Christ bring us down and bring gray into the color and bind us so we feel miserable and empty? Jesus says, I want to liberate you to give you life fully, not simple existence. Don't settle for it. I want you to be fully alive. That is my purpose, my plan. It is my breath in your lungs. And we choose because we want to be impacted, want to have intimacy with him, to pour out our praise of thanks. Thank you. Even when the tires are flat. When Jesus saw that the scribe had answered intelligently, that he's getting it, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I love this because even when Jesus lays all this out, he first says, you're on the right track, you're on the right journey. And then he answers his questions and shows him everything he was seeking in the sense of, I want you to be so bare and exposed before God that you know that he knows all that you care about and all that you are, all your passions, all your desires, all the things that make you you, your will, yourself, your intellect, your mind space you're even in. But 
You're not far from the kingdom of God. He leaves it open-ended. He doesn't force it. Come, repent. Seek me. He makes himself available, but he also leaves it in that person's care, in that person's understanding under their own convictions, their own movement, their own desires, because he loves him. He loves us. I love the power of choice. Sometimes I hate it. God, why don't you just fix this? Well, Aaron, do you remember when he did this? Yes. You think that was a wise choice? No. Could that possibly be a result of this? Yes. But why don't you fix it for me? That's just that human, you, I just, you, we do stupid things as people. That's just the way it is. But God says, I love you. Let's work through this together. Sometimes the flat tires in my life, I'm not going to preach at you, are because I've driven over the glass I've left on the road. But God still gets out and changes that flat tire for me. Thank God. And that's why I want to choose to expose myself to him and be intimate and, and be influenced and changed by him so I can be an influence of change to my neighbors and share hope of what Jesus has done in my life. See, evangelism when I was growing up used to be uh, get into heaven so you can save yourself from hellfire. Uh, do good things so God will love you. And that is absolute garbage and wrong. People have taken the movement of Jesus Christ and put it into a formulated, institutionalized religion based about Jesus and it limits you from getting to Jesus which is absolutely mind-boggling because that's the same thing he stood up against 2,000 years ago. Love makes us radically new through Jesus Christ. Not what we do, not even our best desires, but what we can do, our best efforts. It's about loving him because we allow him to love us first, which again is the choice. God's not going to force himself upon you. I've used this terminology before. The thing is, when you look at nowadays, and if someone forces their love upon someone else in this world, we call it rape. God is not in the business of raping any of the kids because he loves us and he will continue to pursue us to the last second of the last day of our lives because he says, I love you. I will not force myself upon you. I want you to want it. And I want you to know that I desire you as you are. There is no fixing you need to do before you come to me. And too many times people have this notion because of bad experiences and bad representation of the church, not this church, but the church in general. I can't go and be in that community even though I want to be on this journey of understanding God because I'm not good enough. I'm too broken. I need to fix this part of my life before I go to him. And I keep telling people, stop trying to wash your hands before you have a bath. I don't care if someone walks in here and they've got a needle still in their arm because I shot up 10 minutes ago. Come, if you want to be here, be here. And if God's going to do something in your life, fantastic. If you want to walk out the door, we're going to be sad. Ken's probably still going to hug you. But that's the way it's going to be. You don't have to be a certain way to be here, and that's the thing. I think that's probably the reason why God is like, well, I might just call people for membership randomly, so be prepared. And I'm like, I don't like that. He's like, well, I don't care. And I'm like, great, thanks. But it's all about this change. This change, the love of Jesus Christ, that impacts who we are on every level. Not just here. You know, it's not just convincing someone in an argument. That's why I never argue with people. Well, prove to me God exists. No, I don't have time or the energy or the desire for it, and you're smarter than I am. What? Why would you say that? Well, you're very intelligent. You're very educated. I don't, I'm not wired that way. Why would I have an argument with you? You can't refute my story and my encounter with God. I'm not going to argue theology to win you over by beating you over the head with Scripture. I think that's the stupidest thing I've heard. Some people are gifted in it. Good, they can have it, because I am not that guy. <laughs> gone. But when those people come to me, I say, I just want you to know that I care about you, which is why we have a relationship, and I'm glad you're comfortable enough to come against what I stand for and what I believe. And I start asking questions as to why and taking an interest, because there's a story there. What turned you off to God? Experience, Christians, whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I try and tell them without preaching at them, which is sometimes tricky, Jesus loves you and I care too. Hope you come to know that. And that really ticks them off. Not because I'm trying, because sometimes people just are like, I want to fight. I'm like, no, hug. <laughs> but the thing is, here's what happens. 
after that change occurs. And I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I'm going to read it in the message, which is a very different translation. This came up in my Facebook memories from about five years ago. As I was reading, I thought, wow, this is, this is really cool. I have to share this. 2 Corinthians 5, starting at the 16th verse. Because of this decision, this decision to completely be intimate and involved and encountered with Christ, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We look inside and we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start and is created new. That there's this opportunity to become something new, a whole new life. The old life is gone. A new life burgens. Look at this. All this comes from God who has settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing and we're Christ's representatives. This is a letter by Paul to the church in Corinth. What he's saying is don't go out and preach at the world, love them. But first of all, show the world the example of Christ doing in your life by being the difference inside the community of Jesus Christ. If something is broken or wrong, fix it. If God has put you right, which is where we get the word righteousness from, which can never come from self, it always comes from God, that my righteousness is his alone, He's put me in a righteous state because of Jesus Christ. Then he's also started to change and impact who I am. And the action that was listed last of the thing that Jesus said, love God with all your strength and the actions that follow, which is everything that we do in response to that change, let God use that so you can start to be an uh, individual of change, a vessel of God, and experience an encounter of character change. Be that example. And if you know that you are in wrong standing with people inside this, the Christian circle, make it right. Because if we can't get it right in a safe place where we say we all believe the same thing and serve the same God, then he's not going to use us out there. There needs to be grace here before there's grace out there. But far often we have these, we have big visions, which is fine. That's great. But God wants us to be a unified body so we can be a unified movement moving in sync with him and each other. God said, I want you to be in right relationship with God so you can be in right relationship with yourself and other people that are in close proximity to you. That's what neighbor means. It doesn't mean the person who lives on your left or your right. I got a Sudanese family that are Christians, love Jesus on my white side, and I've got shut-ins on my left that just stare at you through the windows. You wave high and look like an idiot. Yes, I should love them too, but it's everyone that you come in contact with. Love them because they're mine. They have value. Start it in the church. Be Christ's representatives. That's the power of our stories and our testimonies. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. He's saying to love him with all that you have, your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and encourage people along their journey, and be real, and allow them to develop that understanding, that intimacy, and that conviction for themselves. Don't force it. Love them. You don't save anyone. You didn't save yourself. You're not going to save this other person, but just love them, and let God be God, and trust that he's big enough to do his work and his timing. We are a part of the movement of Jesus Christ. I just looked at the clock. It's actually getting long. But you know what? I'm going to keep going. No one's left yet, so that's great, right? We are at the end of uh, the service today, after I sing happy birthday to Angelo, before anyone leaves. I'm going to offer up the opportunity for anyone who wants to become a member of this church to come up and do so. And if you say no, that's fine. If you say yes, we're going to do that. And I probably will have several other opportunities in the future as well. But for the practical application part, when you have this change, you see, a lot of times, you got to walk a fine line as a preacher of what you share in most places. Because it either makes people uncomfortable, 
or you lose face in front of people. They even like kind of allude to that in Bible college. The problem is, if you can't be real in your own sufferings and God's goodness in those moments, then really, you're, you're really robbing other people of that story of what he's done. And if, you, if anyone even here views me as like, I want to be like him, in the sense of that God didn't do something, great, but no more than that. Because I hate it when people say, why would you share that? Because people don't view you the same way. I'm like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, they, they view you lower as more human. I am. Don't put me as some sort of figurehead. You're putting me between you and God then. And I hope no one on Sunday mornings comes here and says, oh, I want to hear the voice of God. If he's speaking to you through the message, it's great, because he sure is for me. This is more just a regurgitation of my own life and my own devotion and what he's teaching me. We're all on a journey of learning to submit to God, to be like God, to be loved by him, to love other people. And it's a journey, and it is a struggle sometimes. But I am no more than anyone else in this room. Peter says we are all a part of a royal priesthood. So don't view me as anything else. I say that because I'm going to share something which is intimate. You know, my whole marriage has been based upon the same timeline as I started my previous job, which was toxic. And it didn't start off awful, but it's like a time bomb. It slowly builds and destroys. So learning to adjust to having someone else in my life to love them as Christ's daughter and as my counterpart was really difficult when my foundation was rotting beneath me. And then I had a mental breakdown. And Melly had to pick up all these pieces. And I had no income and we had a child on our way. And there was no hope for a future and there was absolute drawback from me to the point where I really lost a lot of myself which has taken a long time to come back. Confidence, humor, passion to preach. I was out of the ministry for a couple of years and really just floating in a church that I was okay enough to be in but I didn't want any connection because I didn't really know if I wanted to be a pastor ever again. I was so hurt and broken and damaged by my previous encounter. And that was starting to affect my personal marriage life. And it got worse, and then we started to resent each other, and we actually got to a point where we both decided, are we going to stay in this marriage or are we going to get divorced, if I can be honest? Because I just, I had no, no desire to love my wife, and she had no desire to love me because of our situations, not because we're so horrible, because we're human. And I heard this story of this guy who was in a very similar spot and he said, you know, he chose to leave his wife and if I can be very real with you here, he found someone else who was married and they had an affair and he said the intimacy physically was fantastic. He had sex like he hadn't had in years with this person. He thought, oh, this is great. They were able to connect and be real because they both struggled with the same emotional damaging things. And he said a couple years went by and the same patterns of problems came up and he said he started to have conviction of missing his wife. And then years went by and the divorce was settled and they were splitting time with the kids and she found someone else and he said, I started to hurt and grieve that this person had found somebody else and he had to go through all these emotions and he basically, what the end of it was, I wish I had chosen to stay and let God do a work in me so I didn't have to find out this way what I was missing and I fell on my knees and I said, okay Jesus, I don't want to be this husband anymore. I know the truth but what you said in scripture, I feel nothing like that. But if you can fix this, I'm choosing to stay. I'm choosing to give you my heart, my soul, my mind, and the actions of showing her love that will follow. But you've got to do the work because I really don't care sometimes. And you know what happened? Things started to change. I'm not blowing smoke. I'm not feeding you BS. I'm sharing my story. And I started to see things differently. It took time. It wasn't an instant fix, which I really would have loved. Oh, if I could have just been the perfect husband, just like that. But it's a journey. But it started with a choice. God said, okay, I'll do a work. And the way I started to have different affections for things, and the way I decided to spend my time differently, started to change. And I started to see things differently, even small things, which, which sound stupid but really make a big difference. Like the chores she was upset that I was neglecting in the time frame she wanted them to be done, which really irritated her because of a whole lot of other things. I started to see them and do them and want to do them and even think about them. My intellect had changed. My, my desire to do these things had changed. I woke up early with the excitement some days, which is disgusting. I should go take the freaking garbage out. 
I should take the compost out and throw out the recycling so Melody wakes up and she'll be excited. And it was like I was giving her a gift on Christmas morning. And that has never changed. It's gotten stronger. And she and I had a date night on Friday and we really kind of went over this stuff and I, for the first time, kind of vocalized what the change had been. And she said, you know what? The same thing has happened with me (laughs) around the same bloody time. I had no idea. But then the way she interacted with me, which is my experience, changed. And she told me the journey that she had to go on, decisions she had to make to get there. It is powerful. It is time-consuming. It is difficult and frustrating at times, no matter what relationship it is, no matter what part of the journey you're on. But I promise you, it can happen. I do not invest myself in the things that aren't real and aren't real for me, and I would not be up here being a preacher if I didn't believe it had practical implications for you. And the fact that we're in this together as a part of a desired movement of people who want to be loved by God to have their passions, their emotions, their desires, their appetites, their intellect, and the strength and action that follows impacted by a living, breathing, loving, pursuing God, here we are. Jesus, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for the words in the Psalms, Lord God, where King David comes to me, he says, create in me a clean heart, a new heart, O God, and renew a proper right-standing spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, your saving intimacy in me. Take not your spirit from me, but renew a right spirit a proper heart, a changed heart. Not a religious burden, but an intimate moment of change in who I am because of Jesus Christ. And let me be a difference maker in other people's lives. Let me draw in the people who are broken and hungry, Lord. Let this people be a people of movement that are open to you and receptive to all others who are in those same boats and say, come, let me walk this journey with you. Let me be the example and share my stories and tell you about how I'm so dependent upon Jesus Christ. I am a sailboat in the midst of a hurricane and he keeps me afloat. Or I've climbed a mountain I could not climb on my own, but he carried me. Or my tire was flat, he fixed it, and I'm now on my way on a journey again. Let us be a people of reception, of grace and love and value of ourselves and other people because of the work you've done and are doing In Jesus' name, amen.